Some time later, the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision and said to him, Do not be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you, and your reward will be great. But Abram replied, O sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? Since you have given me no children, Eliezer of Damascus, a servant in my household, will inherit all my wealth. You have given me no descendants of my own, so one of my servants will be my heir. Then the Lord said to him, No, your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. Then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, Look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That is how many descendants you will have. And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. Then the Lord told him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land as your possession. But Abram replied, O sovereign Lord, how can I be sure that I will actually possess it? The Lord told him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. So Abram presented all of these to him and killed them. Then he cut each animal down the middle and laid the halves side by side. He did not, however, cut the birds in half. Some vultures swooped down to eat the carcasses, but Abram chased them away. As the sun was going down, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a terrifying darkness came down over him. Then the Lord said to Abram, You can be sure that your descendants will be strangers in a foreign land, where they will be oppressed as slaves for four hundred years. But I will punish the nation that enslaves them, and in the end, they will come away with great wealth. As for you, you will die in peace and be buried at a ripe old age. After four generations, your descendants will return here to this land, for the sins of the Amorites do not yet warrant their destruction. After the sun went down and darkness fell, Abram saw a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch pass between the halves of the carcasses. So the Lord made a covenant with Abram that day and said, I have given this land to your descendants all the way from the border of Egypt to the great Euphrates River. Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm so glad you could join us today. And before I get started in today's message, I want to let you know about something that's coming up, something for Christmas, that we are really excited about and we want you to participate in. It's called Connected Christmas, and this is what it's about. We realize that during COVID especially, there's been all kinds of ways that we have been kind of torn apart and isolated and that sort of thing. And we want to bring the church together. We want to practice hospitality as a church. And this is how you can participate. On December 11th, we want the church, all of us, to get together with someone else. Someone that you might not necessarily normally get together with. And we want you to go for breakfast, go for a walk, go for coffee, have them over to your house, whatever it is, just be connected. Get to know someone you normally wouldn't spend time with. And in this way, we're going to become more connected as a church. We can't imagine a better way to celebrate Christmas than by getting back together and intentionally getting together with one another. So, Keep that date in mind. If you can't get together on December 11th specifically, take another day. But we are specifically targeting December 11th, which is a Saturday. So book that off. Spend some time. Already make arrangements with someone. Say, hey, come on over for breakfast or let's go out for breakfast. Whatever it may be. December 11th, Connected Christmas. Okay, let's dive into today's message. I'm excited about this. And you might remember... I mean, if your memory is like mine and it's really good and really short, I just want to do a little bit of a recap. This whole series started with a question that I had, which is why does God care so much about sex? Out of the eight sin lists in the New Testament, sex outside of marriage between one man and one woman for life is listed each time. This is clearly an important issue to God. The question is, why? And in order to answer this question, 
we started off talking about identity. We talked about how our identity is given to us by God. It is something that we receive from Him. It's not something like our culture says that comes from within us and we have to discover it. No, our identity comes in, our, in God's love for us, our relationship with Him. That is our identity. And then we talked about design and how God created us in His image. And that gives us all a sense of worth, a sense of value, a sense of equality as human beings. Then we talked about God's grand purpose for all of us. And you might recall the word yada, which is Hebrew for to know, to experience intimately. That's what God wants for all of us. He wants us to yada him, to experience him. That's the whole grand story. And then we talked uh, for a couple weeks about God's use of symbols, that as he tells the big story, he loves symbols and loves to spread them throughout to teach us an aspect of the big story. And last time we were together, we talked about marriage. And that was just all a warm-up. You might recall that I said early in the series that I'm going to have a series of messages and all of them are like pieces of a puzzle. And all we've been doing is just turning the pieces over so we can see them all. And over the next three weeks, we are going to start putting those pieces together. And we're going to answer that question, why does God care so much about sex? Now, in order to hit bedrock on this issue, we have to talk about covenants. Covenants. God is covenantal. And we talked about two specific kinds way back many weeks ago about covenants, two different kinds. One's suzerainty and one's promissory. Now, a suzerainty covenant is between two non-equal parties where the suzerain dictates the terms. Now, I talked before about how curfew is like a suzerainty covenant. Here's another one. Uh, an agreement between a boss and an employee is a suzerainty agreement. I will pay you, says the suzerain, if you do this and this and this and this. So there's, there's uh, parameters around this thing. You have to do something in order for this covenant to work. You do and all is well. You don't and here's what you can expect. It's like a contract that way. But a promissory covenant is very different. It's unilateral. It is unconditional. Where one party makes a pledge and takes full responsibility for carrying out the, the covenant itself. Now the question of course is, why would anyone want to make a promissory covenant with no guarantee? It sounds insane. And yet today and this weekend, all around the world, men and women are coming together, walking down the aisle, standing before their friends, their family, people that they love, and they are making promissory covenants. They are making promises to love, honor, cherish until death. It is unconditional. That sounds insane. Another type of promissory covenant is unspoken. And I haven't mentioned this one before, but it's made often between conception and birth for each one of us where it's, and again, it's unspoken, but there's uh, like a covenant made between a parent and a child that says, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to protect you no matter what I get in return. <laughs> and, and no parent knows what getting nothing in return really looks like, you know, until they get into it. But that is a type of promissory covenant. And it's interesting that in our culture, even though uh, the, the covenant between parent and child is unspoken and semi-legal, I mean, it, there, there are legalities around that. It's different from a marriage where it is legal and, uh, and spoken. But in our culture, it seems less shameful to uh, to renege on that promissory covenant with a spouse than it is to renege on that unspoken promissory covenant with a child. People look down on those, especially if they neglect or harm 
their own child. Now, marriage is often seen as less than promissory as a result. It's more suzerainty, where you do or I'm out. And when that happens, when a, a, a marriage covenant shifts from promissory to suzerainty, then couples begin to parent each other. They begin to take turns as the suzerain. And they say, oh yeah, my spouse and I, we're completely equal. I'm just a little more equal than they are. You know what I mean? Because my happiness comes first. And so there's, we tend to treat our spouses with punishments and rewards rather than loving each other. <laughs> but I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, let's get back to covenants and covenants that God makes with us. There's this incredible scene in Genesis 15, and I would encourage you to read the whole account. It is so cool, where God is making a promissory covenant with Abraham. Based on Abraham's faith, God makes a promissory covenant with Abraham, telling him that he is going to bless him, he's going to multiply his descendants, and ultimately bless the entire world through Abraham. And then there is this bizarre ritual it's hard to believe, but they, Abraham was told to take certain animals and sacrifice them and split them in half. And each half laying across from each other in this kind of line. And then as it got dark, God took the form of a torch or a light and passed in between the pieces. Now, God loves symbolism. And what was that all about? Well, this is a way to ratify or to make legal that covenant. And in doing that, God is saying, if I don't fulfill this promissory covenant to you, may my fate be like these animals. It was serious business. God was serious about this covenant. Now, God would go on to make other covenants with other people and that sort of thing, but he had at least one more promissory covenant that he was going to make not with Abraham but with all people and there were three key components to this to this covenant it was going to be exclusive it was going to be legal and it was going to be permanent now if you've been paying attention to these sermons in the last few weeks that list is going to sound very familiar to you the gospel message itself is basically a promissory covenant resulting in this beautiful kingdom. But each part, each one of those things that I listed, each part of the covenant provides a stumbling block. And I might just end up talking you out of coming to worship services altogether by the end of this. Let's start with exclusive. This covenant, this promissory covenant that God is making with all people is going to be exclusive. And you look at the way that God speaks to us. Even in the Ten Commandments, he said, you will have no other gods. None. None beside me. And in, Jesus summarized the whole law by saying, we shall worship the Lord our God and serve him only. That's the exclusive language. This is a promissory covenant and it is exclusive in nature. Now, I'm going to just show you, I kind of went a little bit overboard on this, but I just wanted to show you how often God emphasizes the exclusive nature and the possessive language of how this covenant was going to look like. Now, let's go back to the prophets of the Old Testament, looking forward to this new covenant that's coming. And in Jeremiah 24, we read, I will give them hearts that recognize me as Lord. They will be my people and I will be their God. Jeremiah 31, this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel on that day. I will put my instructions deep within them, and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. One more time, Ezekiel 11, I will give them singleness of heart and put a new spirit within them. I will take away their stony, stubborn hearts and give them a tender, responsive heart so that they will obey my decrees and regulations. And here it comes. They will true, then they will truly be my people and I will be their God. My people. 
That is possessive language. Now, we may talk in terms of my boss or my hairdresser, but you don't often have intimacy. There's no sense of possession there. You know, there's no closest. I mean, and that's because they're interchangeable. You might have another boss. You might have another hairdresser down the road somewhere. But think more like the possessive nature of very intimate relationships. My spouse. My child. My BFF. There's a reason that on Valentine's Day, one of the things that we talk about or is advertised is be mine. There's a possessiveness in intimacy. That's not the kind of relationship you have with your hairdresser. You know, unless you have a very different relationship with your hairdresser than I do. Anyway, this new covenant is exclusive. This my, this your language, you know, is, is amazing. And you see it throughout scripture when you're talking about this new covenant. It's over and over and over again. And right now at Breakfast at Tracy's, we are talking about the kingdom. And you see this, uh, this language of being, of us, of God being our God and he, uh, of God uh, being our God and we being his people. There's a possessive nature. It's an exclusive nature. And then we get to the New Testament and this is repeated over again. It says, but this is the new covenant. Here it is, that I will make with the people of Israel on that day. I will be their God and they will be my people and I will forgive their wickedness and I will never again remember their sins. Do you see what's happening here? This is not only exclusive language, it's also promissory. It's about what God will do. No exceptions. It's not not an if statement. It's this is what I will do. I will forgive. I will never again remember their sins. God is reminding us of the nature of this covenant is promissory, not suzerainty. This is not a boss-employee kind of covenant. And it's going to be exclusive. Now, this brings us to our first problem. And the problem is this. We often don't like to be in exclusive relationships. See, because quite often we want Jesus and. We want Jesus and we want to be popular. We want Jesus and. And we want to be in control. We want Jesus and we want to be comfortable. And whatever that comes after and, whatever fills in that blank, that's what we'd rather have a covenant with. That's who we're really serving. That's what we're really building our lives around. We may say, I want Jesus and the ability to choose what is right for myself. And in in all of those instances, we are saying, I want to maintain my independence from God. I want to base my life on other things, not just Jesus. And this, while this covenant, this promissory covenant is open to all, it's for exclusive members only. That's part of the parameter. If you don't want it to be exclusive, you are not part of this covenant. Okay, so that brings us to the second part of this covenant. It's going to be legal. Now, we already talked about how Abraham Uh, you know, kind of set things up and God made it legal by, you know, ratifying that covenant with with animals and all that sort of thing, made it binding. Now, it used to be that covenants, agreements were made verbally, you know, that people would uh, speak a covenant and that was fine. We read in the book of Ruth how people would hand over their shoe and that was a way of ratifying an agreement and making it legal. There are are other ways, you know, when a judge brings down their gavel, that makes it legal. That is the the thing that says now this is going to happen. And there's other ways. We don't live in so much a verbal culture. We live in a signing culture. And And that's what makes it legal. I remember signing to buy my house in Nanaimo. Man, I thought my wrist was going to fall off. You know, sign here, sign there, initial there, give blood here, sign over your firstborn here. It was on and on and on, man. And all of that made it legal. That's, you know, pretty standard stuff these days. Unfortunately, there's no court, though, when it came to an agreement bet- uh, and a covenant between God and us, there's no court to oversee that. So how does God make it legal. How does he make it binding? Well, Jesus tells us. When we go to the Lord's table, we read these words. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them. Jesus gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it, for this is my 
blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. And we read in Hebrews towards the end, he's giving this wonderful blessing and he says essentially the same thing. Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified, ratified an eternal covenant with his blood. The covenant, this promissory covenant between God and the church was made legal by the blood of Jesus. And this brings us to another problem. Because we don't like that idea as humans. We don't like the idea of this covenant being made legal just by the blood of Jesus. We want, we prefer more of a suzerainty covenant where we have to perform or we have to earn our way into this covenant. The idea of it just being based on Jesus and his blood, that's too humbling for us. We don't like that. We would rather have uh, a, a, a covenant with God that comes about by being good people or by being woke or by being moral, but not Jesus' blood. That's just too humbling for us. So in order to make this covenant legal, we might make up rules. We might make up religious rules or follow popular rules as a way to qualify us to be part of this covenant. We want to, in essence, save ourselves. And you and others may very well be in a worship service to fulfill your end of a suzerainty covenant. In fact, much of the religious activity that you might be doing today be done because you want to enter into a suzerainty covenant where you are contributing, where you are bringing something, you are fulfilling your end of the bargain. But God is offering us a promissory covenant and he made it legal only by the blood of Jesus, not by anything that we bring. And this brings us to the third part of this promissory covenant, which is it has to be permanent. This is a covenant to cover the rest of time. When we read these words this, in the prophet uh, Jeremiah, we read, In those coming days, says the Lord, the people of Israel will return home together with the people of Judah. They will come weeping and seeking the Lord their God. What a great picture. They will ask the way to Jerusalem and will start back home again. Now watch this. They will bind themselves to the Lord. They will make a covenant. They will, they will uh, be bound to God uh, legally with an eternal covenant that will never be forgotten. I love this description of this rebuilt Israel, this kingdom where everyone comes home. And this is going to be an eternal covenant. It will never be forgotten. That means in a million years from the start, we, the church, will cling to the parameters of this covenant. We will bind ourselves to God. We will love him. We will be devoted to him in covenant. This is a problem. This brings us to another problem. I mean, an exclusive covenant? Uh, okay, maybe. Legal with just the blood of Jesus? Mm, uh, okay, maybe. But permanent? permanent? Oh no, we prefer a God who kind of stays out of our business at times, you know, kind of turns the other way. We want a God who stays in his lane, a God that we can control. We want him to be there when we need him. It should come as no surprise that marriages today are often kind of seen as open because we treat God that same way too in our covenant with him. We want to be able to be in covenant with him and then not be in covenant with him. And ultimately, it's because we don't trust him. We prefer a God who rescues us and then kind of leaves us alone. But God insists this covenant has got to be exclusive, legal, and permanent. Permanent. 
So why make a promissory covenant? Why do that? Why make all these guarantees that you're going to do all these things? Isn't that degrading? Like, shouldn't God um, stand up for himself a little bit more? Stand up for his rights? Show some respect for himself? Why would he offer to do all these things? Well, this is something we all have to grapple with. Why would God make a promissory covenant to the church that is exclusive, legal, and permanent with no guarantees? <laughs> you probably know the answer already. Because many of you watching this have entered into this type of covenant yourself. Where you willingly stood before your friends and family and you made public promises to one person. It was exclusive. You signed legal documents, making it legal. And you used the words, until death, making it permanent. Why would you do something so foolish, so degrading? Well, it's the same for God. There's only one clear answer. Love. Love is what makes us do these things. Because in order to have intimacy, real intimacy, there can be no holding back. There can be no independence, no demanding our own rights, no worried about, no worrying about our own happiness and what we're getting, no suzerainty agreements. Because in all of that, it sets up an unsafe arrangement, an unsafe, unstable relationship. I mentioned before that love in our culture is often seen as a, as a feeling. It's an affection that comes and goes. The greater the feeling, the greater the love. But that leaves relationships so insecure because your feelings will go up one day and down another. But that's not how love is seen in, in the Bible. Love is often about happiness, but not about how much you can get. It's about how much happiness you can give. And I've mentioned before, love is measured in the Bible by how much you are willing to sacrifice, how much you're willing to lose, how much freedom you are willing to put aside for that other person. That is true love. Love is not measured by the feelings you receive, but the sacrifices you are willing to make. That's love. And there's no doubt in my mind why the writers of the New Testament kept pointing back to the cross and saying, you want to know how loved you are? That's how loved you are. Look to the cross. The cross demonstrates God's love where he gave up everything. He gave up his dignity. He gave up his possessions. He gave up glory, praise, power, protection. He held nothing back from you in order to join in this covenant. He degraded himself and took on the nature of a slave, we are told. He, and in doing so, he paved the way to an exclusive, legal, and permanent covenant that is promissory, promissory in nature. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't define love the way that, the way that we often define love as to how, how much he can get? Can you imagine him being up on the cross and saying, yeah, this, isn't, this relationship isn't making me happy anymore. I'm not getting much out of this. I, I think I want out. I think I've had enough now. Can you imagine if Jesus defined love the way that we humans do? So he wants his, this covenant with us with no guarantees and he invites, invites you into that covenant today. But the real question this morning for every single one of us is to ask ourselves, is that really what we want? See, many people right now, even perhaps you, you assume you're good with God, but you have no covenant with him. Now, he's not going to force this covenant on you. You have to agree to the terms. But the terms are that this is going to be an exclusive arrangement. Not Jesus and the approval of others. Not Jesus and my sexual behavior. Not Jesus and my pursuit of money. Just Jesus. It is going to be a legal arrangement. Ratified, made legal by the blood of Jesus only. There's nothing we can contribute. Our wokeness won't help. Our morality won't help. Our purity won't help. Or jumping on every bandwagon issue that comes along is not going to help. And it has to be permanent. Not a relationship that's on again, off again, depending on how busy you are or whether you feel like it or whether it's convenient. Because God cannot be used and God cannot be controlled. My hope is that a thousand times you would say yes to this covenant. Because no one will love you like this. No one offers you this kind of intimacy. There's only one avenue to yada, 
knowing God intimately. Because deep down inside of us, all of us deeply want to be known and loved. But only God truly knows us. So we quite often give up and we say, "Ah, I guess I'll just go for being loved then. But we feel unworthy because we know other people don't really know us. They don't know our deepest, darkest secrets. They don't know our true motivations, but God does. And that's why the greatest intimacy can only come in a relationship with God. Listen. Listen for a moment. When you accept every part of this covenant, the exclusive part, the legal part, and the permanent part, it will break you inside. It will break you. It will renew you. It will transform you. It will make you sing. It will become your identity. You will begin to build your life around that truth. It will be your source of joy and peace because you will never know a love like this. If you are not absolutely, absolutely gobsmacked by the gospel message, you are trying to have a suzerainty covenant with God. And that's not what he's offering. You may prefer religiosity over intimacy, over yada. That's not what God is offering. He is offering an exclusive, legal, and permanent covenant of love with you. It's the only way to true intimacy. And next week, As we now know that God is all about covenant and all about ultimately taking us to a place of yada, knowing him intimately, next week we're going to start putting all the pieces together. Please don't miss it. Let's pray. Lord, I want to bring each person to you who may up until this point have been trying to arrange a suzerainty covenant with you. There are many people watching this who do not want an exclusive relationship with you, who may not want a legal arrangement with you based only on the blood of Jesus, and they do not want a permanent relationship with you. Lord, I pray for them that you would speak to them about the intimacy that is waiting for them, the love that is waiting for them only in this promissory covenant that you offer because of Jesus. And Lord, For all those who are in that arrangement with you and loving that arrangement, continue to break us on the inside. Continue to transform us on the inside to look more and more like Jesus. Lord, help us to not just preach the gospel to those around us. Help us to live the gospel message. May it humble us and also fill us with great security in your love. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you, everyone. Take care. We'll see you next week.